Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the Factory Reset Podcast. This podcast is all about starting fresh with what Jesus and the apostles actually said and did. In the last few episodes, I've been talking about a very important part of the law of the Messiah for the New Covenant, gospel nonviolence. I talked about how Jesus lived, the example that he left for those who would be his disciples and who would walk in his footsteps. And I talked in the last episode about several basic principles of the Christian life, principles that will naturally lead us to gospel nonviolence if we simply work out their implications and apply them consistently. In this episode, I want to just introduce the topic of what Jesus actually taught and said specifically about this issue with two simple observations about the sermons that Jesus preached in Matthew 5 to 7 and Luke chapter 6, two primary texts about this issue of love for enemies and nonviolence. And my hope is that these two observations will help whoever may be listening, to get serious about this issue, to bring it onto the front burner in their mind. Because in my experience, most who claim to be Christians today think of this as sort of a side issue. And it can be really hard to get, to get professing Christians to get interested in this. And there's just kind of this casual approach to it, like, did Jesus teach nonviolence? Did he teach that kind of love for enemies? We're not really sure. It doesn't really matter. Let's not get too focused on peripheral issues. But this is not a peripheral issue to Jesus, and it shouldn't be to us either. And I hope that you're going to agree with me by the end of this short episode. For some reason, the Church of the Apostles considered this to be essential to the Christian faith, this issue of love for enemies. Why is that? What did they see in the scriptures that so many of us seem to miss? Because many of us seem to think that what's most important is right theology, what you believe about the Trinity and Christology and what happened on the cross and those kind of things. And so we search the scripture for theological truths, wanting to make sure that we're believing the right things. And those are important things, obviously. But while Jesus and the apostles do teach some simple theological truths that even a child can grasp, what they emphasize, by far, what they emphasize as of most importance is how we live in response to Jesus. And when you begin reading the New, the New Testament, looking for what it says about that, about how to live in faith, knowing that only those who do the will of the Father in response to Jesus will enter the kingdom in the end, maybe then you begin to see things that you glossed over before. You begin to emphasize things that you ignored before. Things start to jump off the page at you that you just you just passed passed by before okay so on to these these two observations that I want to talk about um, they are number one that love for enemies and non-resistance is given special emphasis in Jesus preaching and number two that Jesus connects love for enemies with our being children of God so, observation number one, love for enemies is given special emphasis in the preaching of Jesus in his sermons. Suppose there's a world-renowned expert in leadership who's going to be the guest speaker at an all-day leadership conference going from morning to evening. And suppose the conference is going to revolve around two talks that this expert will be giving on the subject of good leadership. There's going to be one talk in the morning and one in the afternoon. And everything that happens around and in between these two presentations 
are for things like Q&A and various breakout sessions and things like that. And at those times, people attending the conference will be able to focus in on various issues and questions that might be on their minds. And the expert will have the chance to dialogue with people in real time according to whatever issues they might raise or whatever might come up in the discussion. Now, obviously, anything that this leadership expert has to say during the Q&A or during a breakout session, anything that they might say about leadership to whoever's present during the lunch break is going to be important. You really don't want to miss that kind of stuff. That's precious information. But when that leadership expert gets up to address everybody in the morning talk, everyone who is wise is really going to want to lean in and listen very carefully because they know, okay, this is not Q&A where we get to talk about and, and ask questions about what's on our mind, but what we're about to hear is what they think we need to know the most. This is what's on their mind. This is what they, as the expert, want to make sure none of us misses today. Let me focus here and take some notes and make sure that I get the big ideas they want to impart to us. And let's say that in the morning talk, this leadership expert discusses 10 very important topics pertaining to good leadership. You really need to apply what they're saying on all of these 10 important issues if you want to be a truly great leader. But now suppose that later in the day, when they give the afternoon talk, they only discuss a few select issues that they had covered in the first talk, and that they spend most of the afternoon presentation on only two of those 10 subjects that they had covered in the morning. They already talked about these two issues in the first presentation, but now they go a bit deeper into them and they hit them from another angle and they give some more insight into them. And they even repeat almost exactly some of what they had already said in their first talk about these two, two issues as if to drive it home again, to emphasize it, to get it to really sink in for people. That would be really significant, wouldn't it? The people leaving that conference shouldn't need anyone to tell them that these two topics are really important. It should be obvious. These are the only two issues the expert gave a lot of time to in both of their presentations. Bells should be going off in people's minds, alerting them to the centrality of these two issues when it comes to good leadership. And the people leaving the conference should understand, okay, this is like Leadership 101. You absolutely cannot miss this. You're definitely going to fail at leadership if you don't get this kind of stuff. So what's this got to do with love for enemies and non-resistance? Why is that issue so important? Well, it's not that Jesus specifically talks about that issue explicitly on many different occasions in the Gospels. There are other things that he discusses more often. And anything that comes up frequently in his teachings should obviously be really important to us. But what should get our attention on this particular issue is not the frequency with which Jesus teaches on it, but where he chooses to teach on it the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Plain. These two sermons are central in Jesus' preaching. They're not like his other public teachings. They both begin with different versions of the Beatitudes. And then there's a body of teaching on how to live as his disciples, and they conclude with a warning to obey what is being taught in the sermon in order for it to go well for us in the judgment, in order for us to be like wise men who build their house on the rock, who hear what Jesus says and who do it. On other occasions, when Jesus speaks publicly, 
He's often telling parables to the crowds that they don't really understand. And then he explains it privately to his disciples. And they're not usually moral teachings and commandments in the way that these sermons are. And when it comes to several topics that Jesus taught on publicly or privately, his teachings were often in response to a question that his disciples or his enemies specifically asked him. For example, Jesus gives a teaching in Matthew 19 and Mark 10 on divorce and remarriage, but he didn't initiate that discussion. Some people came and specifically asked him about it. Or in John 3, Jesus goes into the subject of the new birth privately in response to Nicodemus. And as far as we know, Jesus never preached on that issue publicly. Same with his teaching about how he was going to give his life as a ransom. He says that to his disciples, reacting to an argument that they had had about which of them was the greatest. Or in Luke chapter 12, when Jesus goes into a teaching about greed, he is responding to a man in the crowd who asks him to tell his brother to divide their inheritance with him. And there are other things throughout the Gospels where Jesus teaches on something and he's, he's reacting to something that's going on around him, to something that some, someone has just asked him. But in these two sermons, Jesus doesn't seem to be responding to anyone. No one is challenging him on anything or asking him about any specific issue that they're wondering about. But he is initiating this teaching. And these are the things that are on his mind. This is what he wants to talk about. Now consider this. The Sermon on the Mount covers a pretty wide range of issues, all of them extremely important, obviously. There's everything in the Beatitudes. And then there's the fulfillment of the law. And then Jesus gets into teachings on things like anger, lust, adultery, Divorce and remarriage, non-resistance, love for enemies, accumulation of wealth, forgiveness, the Lord's Prayer, judging others and hypocrisy, praying, fasting, and giving in secret, anxiety, and several other things. The sermon that Luke records is much shorter. It only covers a few of the central issues covered in the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, there are only a few topics that make it into both of these sermons. There's only a few issues where the sermons overlap, and love for enemies is one of them. And more than that, love for enemies is one of only two issues that are given a lot of attention in both sermons. It's got a major section in Matthew's sermon, and it pretty much takes center stage in Luke's sermon. It's the primary subject from Luke 6, 27 through verse 36. Nine verses, maybe a little more than half of the, of the main body of the sermon. Not baptism, not our role in salvation, not communion or justification by faith, or what the atonement means, or many of the other theological topics that so many Christians focus on and debate over today, important issues, yes. But friends, we want to make sure that the things which were most important to Jesus are the things that are most important to us. But many of us treat this issue like it's some minor issue that we don't really need to give too much attention to. No. This is like Christianity 101. You can't be a true Christian if you don't get this. You're not going to be saved in the end unless you get on board with this kind of thing. It's that important. But many of us are like people who leave the leadership conference and we're all focused on and thinking about and debating about things that the leadership expert didn't even talk about in their two presentations. And we've missed it. We have missed much of what they most wanted us to grasp. Many of us are like that. 
with the things that Jesus taught. The other issue that Jesus gives a lot of attention to in both sermons is the need to avoid judging and condemning others, but rather to be merciful so that we may receive mercy and to take the log out of our eyes so that we can see before we try to help others with their problems. We need to be humble and merciful. We need to warn people. Paul commands us to do that. We shouldn't confuse judging people with warning people. But we need to do it with sobriety, knowing that we ourselves need God's kindness and never warning people in arrogance, placing ourselves on a moral platform above others. Most professing Christians that I know will agree that this issue, that humility, is an extremely important issue, and that you do not want to stand before Jesus one day having been arrogant, holding people in contempt, thinking you don't need mercy from God, unwilling to be merciful to others. Nobody like that is going to enter the kingdom in the end unless they repent. That is a deal breaker. That will not be allowed into God's kingdom on the day of judgment. And the point is that love for enemies and non-resistance is like that. It is just as central to the Christian life and the Christian faith as something like humility. But most of us don't seem to give it the place of importance that Jesus gave it. Why is that? Well, I think that's a complicated question to, to answer. But here's something to consider. One difference between these two issues, love for enemies and, 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 and non-resistance, and then humility, is that it's easy to at least agree verbally with the command not to judge or to take the log out of your eye. Pretty much everyone agrees, at least in theory, that we should not be judgmental towards others and that we should be merciful and that we should not be hypocrites. But love for enemies and nonviolence, that's different. Not very many people are on board with what Jesus says here, even verbally. Not as the apostolic church understood it. And when it comes to applying it in our lives, even fewer are willing to do that. All right, observation number two, very quickly, is that Jesus says that we have to do this in order to be God's children. I get that what I just said will sound like heresy to some people, might sound like works righteousness to some people, but please hear me out, or rather look at what Jesus actually says on this and hear him out. In Matthew's sermon, he says, blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. And later he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. And in Luke's sermon, he says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And so Jesus makes a very clear connection between our loving our enemies, whatever, whatever he means by that, whatever he intends us to do when he says that, very clear connection between that and our being children of God. Of course, we do not have to love our enemies in the way Jesus commands us to, and we don't have to do all the other things he commands either before becoming disciples becoming children of God initially. Nobody lives that way prior to becoming a Christian, and nobody can sustain that without being empowered by the Spirit. But Jesus is not discussing in these sermons how someone is justified initially. He's talking about the life we need to live in order to be justified finally, in order to enter the kingdom in the end. And we will only be called sons and daughters of God once and for all. We will only be those children of God who shine like the sun in the kingdom 
of their father if we obey what he's saying here about love for enemies. That's what he says. So obviously everything Jesus taught in both sermons or anywhere in the Gospels or anything he teaches us through the apostles is important and we have to learn to obey all of it. My point here is that he clearly places a lot of emphasis on this area of our lives and we have got to make it a priority. It has got to stop being this peripheral thing, this minor issue that we don't really give much attention to, don't really look into it. No, it's not that kind of thing. It's a primary thing. It's an essential thing. And we need to treat it as such. Okay. Uh, I hope that gets the wheels turning for, for someone, um, whoever might be listening. And in the next episode, I'll begin to unpack the relevant passages of Matthew 5 and Luke 6. And, uh, and I hope you'll listen with an open mind. If this is something that you struggle with or something that you're still on the fence about, I totally understand that. It's a, it's a difficult issue to grapple with. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you, and please contact me if you would like to talk about these things.